Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is astrophotography. Now, we've done other shows in the past about it, but we're working in a little bit more of the equipment used to capture these wonderful images. With me here in the studio is Gordon Hansen, a member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, and you're also a member of the Ford Club's Astro Imaging Special Interest Group, right, yep. Gordon? Yes, yep. Thanks for having me back. You're welcome. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Now, astrophotography, the art of taking pictures of the sky. It could be nighttime, it could be daytime, the sun, you can image the yep. sun. But uh, what are the types of equipment used to take these photos? Well, the way I thought we'd get in, go into this a little bit is to maybe start with what's the easiest thing somebody can do if they're interested in getting into the, into the hobby or getting into astrophotography. And if we could bring up the first, uh, first image here quick. Uh, okay, this is what's called a star trail. And, and this is probably the easiest thing you can do. Put a camera on a tripod. In this case, I pointed it up towards the north, so up to Polaris, the North Pole, and just let the shutter open. And as you can see, what happens is because the Earth is rotating, it makes the stars look like they're trailing through the sky, and you wind up with something called star trails. And so it could be, in itself, that can be pretty fascinating photos. Uh, by the way, if anybody's interested in that uh, straight line up there in the upper left corner, that was a plane going through, oh, okay. through the image. So <laughs> we didn't have a star doing something strange up there in the, in the sky. That's good to know. What, uh, what type is next? Well, uh, the reason a star uh, star trails are happening again is because the Earth is rotating. Uh, and when it's on a, on a tripod, that's what also be called an alt azimuth mount. And you can say, well, why don't we just kind of rotate the, cam the, the, the mount and we'll follow, the, uh, follow what the stars are doing. So if we could bring up the next three images, and I'll show you what. This is what we really would like to get to. This is a shot of, of, of the constellation Orion. And what we'd like to do is, you know, get all the stars kind of round and get pretty picture, get pretty colors into them. And so this is where we want to get to, e even with a, a relatively short focal length uh, camera on a tripod. But let, let's go to the next image. The, this is out of a planetarium software. And you can see um, the constellation Orion uh, with its picture of the hunter there uh, in the center. And you can see he's kind of, uh, kind of leaning to the right. Um, and this is right around sun, uh, su uh, right after, after um, the sun goes down and, and the constellation is rising in the east. Let's go to the next image. Now we've gone about three or four hours later and the, the Orion is now rotated and is now to the south. And you can see it's rotated to it's now standing straight up. Let's go to the next one. And now it's a couple of hours later now and you can see he's now starting to fall backwards. So what happens is if you take a camera and put it on a tripod and just rotate the tripod around, you'll wind up with things, the images are going to still rotate through the, uh, um, uh, through the image, and that's not what you want to get to. So how would we go about uh, correcting for that? Okay. So the next thing we do is start getting into something called a, um, um, a right ascension declination type mount. So let's, uh, I think we've got some images here. Uh, this is one pretty typical type system, and it's on a fork mount, they call this. And obviously, because you've got a fork with the telescope sticking between it. And you can see the fork is kind of tilted back on an angle. And what you do is you're aligning this now so that the axis of that one rotation is actually pointing directly up at the, at the North Pole. So you're paralleling the rotational axis of the Earth. Now, when, you, when, I, when the telescope rotates, the mount rotates, you're counteracting the stars, but that field rotation has gone away. I see. So that, that gets, gets you to essentially where we want to go. And the uh, other option is something called the German equatorial mount, if we can throw the next one. Um, this is my, my rig in my backyard. And again, it's essentially the same thing. The, 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 the one axis called the right ascension is, is on an angle that uh, pointed directly at the uh, at the, at the pole. If you were down on the South Pole, by the way, if you're down in Australia or something, you'd be pointing it at the South Pole. And okay. things would rotate in, in the other direction. But, but that's, that's how you get um, a correction for the, uh, uh, for the rotation of, 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 the, of the Earth. I think they call it field rotation? Yes, it's yep. field rotation, exactly. Now, these motorized mounts that we've been talking about, especially the fork mount and the German equatorial, uh, they don't track perfectly, do they? Well, that's exactly right. We're not, 
you know, what we really want is, you know, Swiss watches here. And even Swiss watches are not going to be that great. Um, uh, just to put things a little bit in perspective, the kind of accuracy we're looking for when a mount tracks is in the order of about five arc seconds of accuracy or better, depending on the focal length. And just to try and give the people a feeling for what an arc second is, if you can imagine what a degree is, an arc second is that degree split up into 3,600 pieces. So we're looking for some pretty, pretty tiny tracking pretty, accuracy. Pretty tight, yes. Right. Um, the, the way it used to be done, I think we've got, uh, this is a shot of Edwin Hubble uh, from Hubble fame. Yes. Uh, and sitting at, uh, I think this is probably out at, uh, at, at Palomar. And, and what they did in those days is that to keep the telescope going in the right, right place, they sat at the telescope all night long looking through an eyepiece and making corrections to the mount as, as things started drifting off. So they were, they were glued to that chair for as long as their exposures were taking. I've tried it. It's pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like. Yes. So today's world, um, we, we've got the, the, the advantages of some computerized things. So what we do now is, I think the next image is, uh, we start putting a second camera onto the system and put that camera onto, uh, onto a star and let the computer then keep everything in, in place. Um, this is one case, one system where you use what's called an off-axis guider. Uh, it's a little attachment that goes in front of the camera and it's got a, a bit of a, a prism or a mirror that you, find, you get a star just outside the field of view and uh, uh, bounce it sideways into, uh, into the, second, uh, the second chip. And, and then a computer would control yes, it yes. from there. And I think we got one more, let's see what the next slide here looks like. Um, yeah, um, this this is another way of doing it, and uh, where you actually put a second uh, chip right in, adjacent to the primary imaging chip on the camera itself. Okay, and that really becomes a, a good way of an easy, convenient way of doing things. Now, there's other ways you can do it also that you can actually put a second telescope on top of the first telescope and just have the two telescopes mounting. So they, there's several ways to, to get at this. Uh, now, what types of imaging cameras uh, can well, be used? I, I just wanted to make one more quick point about the okay. mount. Um, everybody starts looking at the, the telescope and starts thinking about the cameras, and, and you start to think that's where I need to be spending my money. That, that's not, if you're going to be into doing astrophotography, the rule of thumb is that two-thirds of the dollars you invest should be spent on that mount. Because if you don't have the mount itself can't track reasonably accurately, there's no way these guiding systems are going to keep things in place. So you, you've got to spend your money on, onto that mount. All right, uh, the imaging cameras. Okay, you can start off with a typical point-and-shoot camera and actually just hold them up to, a, up to an eyepiece and take pictures right through the eyepiece. People are doing it with, with their, their, their smartphones. Uh, one of the fellows in our club has done a lot of things. Just he just holds holds it up to the eyepiece and takes a picture, and you can you can start getting some things. Uh, it, 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 you struggle a bit with that, but it's it's something that could be done in the beginning without spending a whole lot of money. Um, as you want to go up into a little bit more sophistication and get a little better control, digital uh, single lens reflexes. Uh, can we go back one? To, um, there we go. This is a, a, a single lens reflex. Uh, that's mounted onto the camera, and you can see the main camera at the back there, and the uh, um, and the and the guide the guide camera attached to it. And so that's 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 one way to do it. The next type of camera, and by the way, those are, are what are called single shot color. So that camera takes the color image all at once. Um, uh, as you want moving up the scale and maybe spending a little bit more money, you get into some dedicated CCD cameras, what it's shown on this rig. So at the back end there, you can see a cap, the, the CCD camera. This is a monochrome camera, so if I want color, what's sitting in front of that is what's called a filter wheel, and it's a motorized wheel with red, green, blue, et cetera, filters sitting in it so I can take separate images through, through the different filters. Let me ask you a question. You just mentioned that versus a camera that takes all the colors at once. Is there an advantage to one over the other? Uh, you, this, this is one that will get you into a, a into a couple of hour debate with, with people. 
Okay. Um, with with a, the, the single shot color, you're actually losing a smidgen of resolution because of the way the single shot colors handle uh, the manufacture of color in the camera. Um, so you pick up a little better resolution with a monochrome one, but a lot of people are doing some very, very nice work with, uh, with digital SLRs. So I, um, the, the big place where it can become an advantage is into some specialized things with what's called narrow band imaging, which become really difficult with a single shot color. So. Okay. Well, uh, this has been a, an interesting discussion. I'm glad that we've been able to bring in some of the aspects of the equipment to, that's used to take the images. We're going to take a short break here. And uh, if you have a question, you can send us an email. The email address is down at the bottom of your screen, as always. And uh, after term of the month with Steve and Witty, we're going to be back with the actual images that have been taken. Stay tuned. The term of the month for June 2014 is the mouthful 2012 VP113. Um, the discoverers of this image uh, named it Biden after the vice president at the time of discovery uh, for, the US, for the U.S. Anyway, it's an unofficial name. Uh, the discovery image uh, shows red, green, and blue dots in kind of a vertical thing with the, green on, with the red on top. And um, as Gordon was uh, saying, if you've got a camera that takes black and white pictures and then you use a filter wheel with red, green, and blue filters, then if you've got a moving object, and this is an object that is moving, then you'll get the object potentially in three different spots. So we have a red dot, a green dot, and a blue dot. And they're not together because uh, there's, a, there's a gap between when the filter wheel uh, slides around. So this object has the largest perihelion, that is, the farthest it gets from the sun, of any known object, uh, 449 astronomical units, which is a, basically the Earth-Sun distance. Uh, it was found at 83 astronomical units, which is uh, more than twice as far as Pluto is uh, from the Sun. The exact size is unknown, but it's likely to be 450 kilometers in diameter, which is 300 miles. This is big enough for it to be spherical. So eventually, we expect this object to become uh, labeled as a dwarf planet. Uh, very interesting object. It's also pink, and that's Term of the Month, 2012, VP113. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome back to our show. The topic for this month's program is astroimaging. And in the first part, we talked about the equipment used to take the images. Now, we're going to get to the good stuff. With me again is Gordon Hansen, a member of the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club. Gordon, what can you tell us about all these great images? Well, this is the fun part, and I can maybe just to reiterate for, for our viewers, um, you know, as an amateur astronomer, I'm, I'm looking to take pretty pictures. We're not really trying to do a whole lot of science here. So, uh, so but that's okay. Art, art is, our, is our game, not, not, not science here. The way I thought we'd approach some of these images is break them into type of objects and go from, oh, maybe what is maybe not some of the easier ones to get to and ending with some of the more difficult things to get to and hopefully the get more colorful as we go. All right. So why don't we start with the first one, which is a uh, uh, globular clusters. Uh, for those who don't know, globular clusters are, as the kind of name describes, it's a cluster of stars that kind of all formed at roughly the same time out of the same, uh, same cloud of gas. And there's enough mass and stars in a globular cluster that these stars stay together for, for a long, long time. They don't, okay. they don't fly apart. So the first one was called M12. It was a uh, image in uh, Ophicus. Just for some distance, it was 15,700 light years away. So they're still in the Milky Way, but uh, um, uh, still the distances are getting pretty good here. Uh, next one is, uh, move on to M22, which is, and you can see these come in, in uh, depending on whether they're anywhere near the Milky Way or, or, or not, you can have a whole lot of background stars. But these can be pretty in themselves. There can be a lots, of, lots of 
four round color stars with color. Um, uh, the stars within the, the clusters themselves can be colorful. Um, so they, they can become fascinating. Um, that's, this one is called M13. This is kind of the granddaddy of globular clusters, uh, at least in the northern hemisphere. Um, this one is almost something you can see naked eye. It's in the, in the constellation Hercules. Um, there's about 300,000 stars in that, in that ball. So there's a there's sizable number, um, about 22,000 light years away. Uh, I guess maybe for scale, the, help me help me out here. Milky Way is about a hundred thousand light years in diameter, so pretty much. Yeah. So these are the, everything we've been. These clusters are are within the Milky Way. They're 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 sort of that halo around the central yes, bulge of the Milky yeah, Way right. galaxy. Um, then we'll move on to open clusters. Uh, again, these are stars that form um, in the same area but now tend to be a lot less mass in those clouds and so that there are fewer stars. And you can see this, this cluster of M29, uh, which is in Cygnus, which is straight overhead during the summer months. Um, this one's only a mere 4,000 light years away. I especially like this one because of those blue and, and golden stars. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty cluster. I was just gonna say that this one really brings out some nice right. contrast in color. Right. Uh, one thing happens with uh, uh, open clusters like this is because there's less mass, they don't, the stars don't stay put, and they tend to start migrating away from the cluster. It's thought that our sun was, uh, uh, was formed inside of the, uh, an open cluster, and there's been people trying to find our sister stars, so to speak. I'm not sure they've been all that successful about it. Uh, we can go on to the next one. This one is called M24. It's called the Sagittarius Star Cloud. This one is square inside the Milky Way. Uh, so you've got all kinds of all kinds of stars within the cluster itself, and then you've got all the stars of the Milky Way itself standing around it. So this this really becomes a populated with lots and lots of stars. And of course, in this image, we're looking back towards the center of the yes, galaxy. Yes. Yes. Right. Sagittarius is like as you say is is looking straight down towards the core of our galaxy. We're our big black hole sitting there keeping us maybe, I don't know, safe is probably the wrong word. <laughs> Lurking, I yeah. think it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, the open clusters tend to be younger than the globular clusters. Um, this is a, a, a great one. Uh, this is called the uh, uh, M45 of the Pleiades. I always mm -hmm. get the pronunciation a little messed up. The Seven Sisters, yep. it's also known. And it's also called Subaru if you're in, uh, in Japan. And a matter of fact, if you uh, look at a a Subaru vehicle and look at their 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 num their, their icon cool. on the yep. front. Mm -hmm. That's that's their icon is uh, is this this uh, uh, this open cluster. This is a, a relatively young cluster. You can see all of the um, uh, the gas and dust is still surrounding those stars, and that's why we get that hazy hazy feeling on it. So this this is a young cluster. This is relatively new. Um, um, it's, it's getting really close, too. It's only 390, 460 light years away. So this is a close-in one and a great object for binoculars. You know, it, it, Absolutely. Yeah, if you get out on a dark night and, and you'll see the smudge of Pleiades up in the sky and, and just put a pair of binoculars you've got sitting in your, in your closet and, and just go up there and look at it. It'll, it, it it's, a, it's a pretty spectacular view. Okay. Okay, this one I like because this one kind of bridges the uh, uh, bridges the gap. I was going to move into galaxies next, and, and this is a, an image that has an open star cluster there in the bottom left corner and a spiral galaxy in the upper right-hand corner. So kind of a fun picture. Uh, now, the placement of these two uh, objects is they're not anywhere nearly near each other. Okay. Um, it's only in the, from our viewpoint here on Earth that they appear to be close by, but they're, I'm sure they're separated by... Uh, well, the, the open cluster is probably in the Milky Way, and that, that other galaxy is probably a million light years or so away. So right. it's in a, a two-dimensional plane, right. and they appear close, right. but in reality, That's with right. a third dimension of depth. Yeah. Right. Okay, so now we'll move on to galaxies. Okay, this is the uh, small Magell Magellanic Cloud. And then we talked about equipment before. Um, th this is an alternative way to take pictures. Um, I I took this image using a telescope in Australia. Oh. Um, one of the options we have today, especially with the internet, is you can rent time on telescopes globally. 
Now, I, my, my chances of ever going this far south to be able to see the small Magellanic Cloud or take pictures of it are probably slim, especially with equipment. So I, I take advantage of using a rentoscope and, and take these pictures. Uh, you can do all that online? That's right. Yeah. Now, the small Magellanic Cloud is a dwarf galaxy that is circling our Milky Way galaxy and will eventually be assimilated and become part of part of the Milky Way. So it's interesting. And, and that's part of the reason why it's got that very irregular shape. It's, it's been, already been kind of shredded apart. Yeah, by it's, a being, close it's being torn up pretty good. Um, this is a small Magellanic cloud, pretty close to it from at least from a advantage is a large Magellanic cloud. And uh, again, you got to be down in Australia, southern southern Africa if you want to see these. Okay, uh, this is always a favorite. This is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, this is right off the uh, end of the uh, uh, handle of the Big Dipper. Um, good bright one. It's it's uh, very photogenic. Uh, it is indeed. Um, you can see the the, the spiral structure. Um, you can see a lot of blues and pinks in here. Blue is is re is light being reflected off of gas and dust within the uh, within the system. And for the same reason, the sky is blue. It shows up as blue when that light gets reflected. Scattered, uh, right. And you mm -hmm. can also see some hinges of pink, which is things called uh, uh, ref uh, emission nebula, which we'll talk about in a few seconds here. Okay. Uh, let's keep on going. Uh, this one is uh, M106. We've gotten pretty far out here. This is 24 million light years away from us, so it's a, uh, it'll take a few Sundays to drive there. <laughs> Indeed. That's right. Uh, next one. This is M101. This this is kind of the granddaddy of face-on spiral galaxies. It, this is actually pretty big. This this probably takes up as uh, uh, about as much space in the sky as, as the moon does. It's a pretty big object, but it's dim. It's it's tough to see, especially in close to uh, to the city here. Um, all right, we're going to move on to nebulas now. Um, this one, if you get a little bit of imagination, is called the Pac-Man Nebula. Pac-Man is usually yellow, if I remember, so this yes, was a was. pink one. But uh, this is a nebula where we've got gas that's being excited by a star down in the center that's making the, the hydrogen gas glow red. Okay. So that's where that pinkish color comes from. And that would be the emission yes, nebula versus the, emission the reflection, nebula. which is blue. Right. And you can see a bit of blue down in the center there, and that's probably close to the this hot star that's caused, probably causing most of that gas to glow in the first place. Um, we go to the next one. Okay, this one we're going to switch to uh, monochrome. This was done with a with a special filter called a, a narrow band filter in hydrogen alpha light, and and this is a, a different kind of uh, of nebula. It's actually a dark nebula. This is like looking at a, a thunderhead with the sun behind it. You know, during dur during the summer. So it's being backlit yes. by the cloud of gas behind right. it. There's a cloud of gas behind it that's being lit up by a by the local star, and at, in a color image that would be all red, and and you got this. Cloud of glass that just looks like a horse head. That looks great. A little nebula. bit of time that we have left, Gordon. You have uh, anything else for our viewers? Well, we got some more, but we can uh, just just more pretty pictures. <laughs> well, I think uh, our uh, our viewers have uh, gotten a pretty good taste of uh, what's possible with uh, astro imaging. Mm -hmm. um, as with any hobby, it uh, it can be a bit expensive and. Uh, but uh, the results, especially if you stick with uh, this particular branch of astronomy, it, it takes some work and some time to refine your techniques, as I'm sure Gordon would attest to. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Gordon for uh, once again being a guest on Astronomy for Everyone. If you'd like to get more information, uh, please check our website. Uh, the website address you can see down there at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next, with What's Up, our own Stephen Witte.
What's up in the night sky for 2014? In the month of June, sunrise pretty much all month and sunset pretty much all month is 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And that's because as you get to the summer solstice, the length of the days doesn't change very fast. So the summer solstice is the first day of summer on the 21st. The moons, uh, on, the, on the 5th, we start out with the first quarter. On the 12th, we have the full moon. On the 19th, we have the third quarter moon. And on the 27th, we have the new moon, which is very hard to see. Uh, Mars sets around uh, 2.30 a.m. And Saturn sets around 4 a.m. So they're together, more or less, in the sky. Uh, Mars is highest at 8.45 p.m., so just in the evening. And um, Saturn is highest at 11 p.m., which is when this uh, image is, uh, uh, is set for. Jupiter sets at 11 p.m. Here I have it at 10 p.m., but you can see that the sun is already shining. Remember, the sun sets at 9 p.m., but it takes a little while for the, the sky to get dark. So we're losing Jupiter. Um, Venus is a morning object. It rises at 4.11 a.m., at least in the middle of the month. And um, so here at 5 a.m., you can see Venus is just rising. If you want to look for Uranus, uh, it rises a little earlier at 2.38 a.m., and Neptune rises at 1 a.m. Uh, so Uranus is in Pisces and Neptune is in Aquarius. But you'll probably need a better chart than this in order to uh, really find these objects. Uh, we have a little special event today, and Don has come back with us to uh, give us a taste of what that's about. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, this month marks the fifth anniversary of Astronomy for Everyone. Now, the AFE team would like to thank the staff of Wyandotte Municipal Services and you, our viewers, for all of your interest and support. And we look forward to bringing you quality program for many years to come. And as Steve always says, keep looking up. It's the best free show in the universe. Mm.